Hi, everyone. We are so glad you could join us for another of the Lympha Press educational webinar series. I am Brenda Viola for Lympha Press, and today's topic is caring for lymphedema patients in a home health setting. We know that right now you are just logging on and getting settled in. And as you do that, please let us know you're here in chat. We would love to hear from you and where you're logging on from. We have two excellent presenters today, and it's been a real joy to actually get to know one I know very well already, and I've gotten to know Chris Nesheim, who is a certified lymphedema therapist. She is one of the instructors with the Norton School. She is really, she her main career is in a home health setting, so what a perfect person to speak to this topic. And she is joined by none other than our Karen Ashforth, who has been flying the globe recently and training and presenting all over the world. We're so honored to have her present on the Lympha Press platform. We have Missy Baylor, who is logging on from Houston, Texas, who also works in a home setting and private practice. Missy, we are so glad you're here. Anyone else want to log in and tell us you're here? We'd love it. But I think that we should just get started with the content and I'm going to disappear and yield the floor to Chris and Karen. Oh, thank you so much, Brenda. It's always a pleasure, always. So uh, just a little bit about the two of us. Um, as, as you mentioned, Brenda, Chris is full-time home health lymphedema um, for the past 10 years and even beyond that. And I have had some home health experience prior to when I became lymphedema certified. Mm -hmm. And then I became, began home care in lymphedema three years ago, my current practice being a mix of outpatient telehealth and home care. So it's been so fun to work together with Chris to get this uh, webinar ready together for you because we have such both a diversity of experience, but a lot of commonality. So without further ado, um, Chris, would you like to go ahead and take it away here? Sure. So um, thank you, Karen, and thank you, Brenda, for this opportunity. So when we were creating this webinar, um, we started to kind of outline and highlight what are some of the differences in treating and working in home care versus the traditional outpatient setting? And first and foremost, when we think about treatment in home care, we have to think about insurance. So oftentimes our patients in home health, we're treating them um, under their Medicare A benefit. So this could be a traditional Medicare, which is a per episode benefit, or um, unfortunately the more <laughs> popular Medicare Advantage plans now that are a per visit episode. Um, anytime we see a patient in the home environment, patients need to meet that homebound requirement. So um, Medicare has all sorts of language that relates to that, but the patient needs to be homebound. Otherwise, they would prefer to pay for them to go to outpatient. And then, of course, um, the biggest difference between um, payment and home care versus outpatient is driven by the OASIS documentation that we have to complete in home care. Um, and any therapist that's working in home health, we know that this is that to our admission process of completing the OASIS documentation. And this decides and determines payment for our home care episode. And so as a result of this, we're seeing a much higher acuity of patient illness with our homebound population. Whereas in traditional outpatient, when I worked in the clinic, we would see patients and they were often um, treated under their Medicare B benefit or commercial insurances. Um, and we would have to be mindful of patients' co-pays and deductibles, which could often be a barrier and limit to treatment, and pay attention to those therapy caps that would often limit our ability to see patients. And I would just add that um, the definition of homebound is that either the patient can't leave the home for medical appointments, or it takes an extreme amount of physical effort for them to get out. Because the reality is, is that 
the patients still have to see their doctors and sometimes they can do telehealth appointments, but the, the practicality of coming in several days a week for therapy treatment is just beyond many of these patients, which qualifies them as homebound. So that, but that is a really important distinction um, between home health and outpatient is that um, inability to participate outside of the home on a regular basis. So just to continue the differences, uh, the home care agency is responsible for all the supplies that the patient uses, and that can be similar to outpatient, but um, sometimes outpatient can um, uh, work uh, through different billing services, but if you are homebound and being seen through home care agency, then um, all of the bandaging supplies, all of the wound care supplies, that comes out of the budget for the home care agency. And correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, but I believe that does not apply to compression garments. I think compression garments would be the patient's responsibility. Is that your experience? It is, except for under Medicare A, um, because Medicare currently, before the implementation of the Lymphedema Treatment Act, will pay for a compression garment for a patient with a non-healing stasis ulcer, um, 30 days or more. So in that regard, the home care agency is responsible for that supply because it falls under the bundled billing um, for our Medicare A episodic patients. Yeah. Right. And in the outpatient setting, we would be able to get that reimbursed through a DME. Um, with a prescription and, and documentation of the, the non-healing wound. So, um, you know, some little fine-tuning differences to know. Yeah. So really, go ahead, please. Oh, and just to tailor on that, um, you know, so different, going back to that homebound status, um, that could limit our treatment length within the home. Because as soon as the patient is no longer homebound, you know, the goal, if the patient is appropriate, is to transition them to outpatient. So we might not fully reach our goals within home health, but set them up for an outpatient treatment. Um, or oftentimes these folks cannot make it to outpatient and we'll continue to see them at home um, under a maintenance episode. And I do see quite a few of my lymphedema patients under the maintenance provision of Medicare A, um, which has been really um, helpful because again, lymphedema is that chronic progressive disease process that falls under that um, maintenance provision of Medicare. Very much so. Yeah. And so it's, it's really a great thing that you, you know, can continue um, treatment in the home to uh, help to prevent patients from uh, having exacerbation of symptoms. Um, you can catch infections right away and hopefully treat them before the patient needs to be hospitalized. And so it's really, in a lot of ways, not only better for the patient, but cost saving as well. And as you said before in the previous slide, Chris, these patients have a higher acuity of care. And so they have more of a likelihood of you know, developing complications. Yeah. So some other differences, do you want to go ahead and take this one? Sure. So working in home health for all of those clinicians that are logging on, as we know, working in the patient's home is definite unique challenges. Um, it could be environment, it could be, you know, family situation. Um, so home care is not as straightforward as having this nice um, clean treatment room that your patient can walk back to. Um, but there are some definite advantages as well. Um, when I work in home care, I have more control over the length of time of my visit. Um, the time of my visit is what's appropriate for the patient that day um, versus having to be scheduled in 45 minute or hour treatment blocks when I was an outpatient. Um, I have immediate access to caregivers for training. So they start from day one a lot of the time with me to work with the patient. Um, so it really can help to maximize and make that home program most appropriate for the patient. Um, but other differences in, in, in the home is that when I walk into the house, I'm not only wearing my 
CLT hat. I'm wearing my occupational therapist hat. I could be wearing um, the social worker hat that day, the doctor, the nurse, um, my physical therapist. Um, we have to be everything and all for our patients um, when we walk into the home that day. And another big um, difference from when I worked in the clinic is I am responsible for fitting all of my patients for their compression garments. Um, these are a population that they can't get out um, to the DME provider, or um, I used to have a fitter that said that they had to be there before 10 in the morning because then they felt like they weren't going to capture the, the best decongestion. And I have patients that because of transportation or mobility or ADL concerns, they couldn't get out of the house and make a 10 a.m. appointment. So I do all of my fitting with my patients at home. Do you wanna to speak to outpatient, Karen? Yeah, yeah. So, um... I'm actually going to start at the end because, um, you know, there is an advantage of having fitters coming to the clinic for garment measurement or fitting, but with COVID um, that just evaporated. And so we're starting to see more and more fitters doing virtual fittings, which is lovely. And that can sometimes be set up in the home as it can in the outpatient setting. Um, so, but but there still is the advantage of having a fitter. Um, they can't come to patients' homes, but they can come to clinics. So I'm just gonna go backwards and say that uh, there's a lot of unknowns. When you have a patient come in, you have no idea what their home environment is like. You don't know what the people around them are like or um, even the physical environment. And that can be tough um, being blinded to that. Sometimes you can figure things out, but there's nothing like being right there in the environment to see what are we dealing with? What barriers are we up against? How helpful is their family? How unhelpful is their family? And, um, you know, to be able to just know. Uh, I think that, um, again, with COVID, we limited the amount of visitors who could come in with patients. And before we would be able to allow two, three family members if needed, because sometimes everyone needed to be instructed. And we got to a point where we weren't allowing anyone other than the patient themselves, which made it very difficult to instruct family members. Now we've relaxed a little bit on that. But again, being able to see, okay, how are people doing this at home and be able to fine tune things that can make a big difference. I would say one of the biggest advantages of outpatient is that we have immediate access to other disciplines in our clinic. I have the physical therapy gym just across from where my office is for lymphedema. And so if I'm concerned about a patient's mobility issues, and I am not going to really address that as fully in my treatment plan as an OT, I can pull a PT in to take a look and see, you know, do you think this person needs a PT consult? So just having that ability to have other people around is a great resource in an outpatient setting. And then there's a lot of limitations in terms of my schedule. I am booked sometimes several months out. And so if a patient has to cancel all of a sudden, it's really hard to reschedule. And the flexibility of the home health schedule is, uh, of course, people are all in different geographical areas, but oftentimes if someone cancels, then you can shuffle things around and sometimes see them at the other end of the day or work them in somewhere else. And um, I don't have that luxury in the outpatient schedule. If they miss their appointment, then then I've got a dead space. And um, I, I, you know, can do paperwork and other things, but I can't necessarily see another patient the way you can just, you know, call your next um, home health patient and say, hey, can I come a little early? So that is um, an advantage of home care is having that flexibility. Another advantage of outpatient is just all the equipment. If, if, if I need to grab a, 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 a laser, an ultrasound machine, um, hot pack, I mean, it's all right there. And in the home, you know, there's only so much we can load into our car. <laughs> so um, that can be a little limiting. And Chris, you were going to mention something about the, the, the scheduling, I think. 
Oh, I definitely, my schedule, um, from the time I start in the morning to what it looks like at the end of the day changes sometimes three and four times. Um, so if you are definitely the type of person that likes to have a plan when they wake up and are not flexible to allow it to change 10 times, home care is not, not the avenue for you because it's constantly changing. I'm pulling patients from the next day or later in the week or shifting geography just to try to get as many people seen um, and get their visits in for the week. But that's the beauty of having that fluid and dynamic schedule that I can control. So. Absolutely. And hey, if there's a garage sale that looks really good, you can always stop for five minutes. Absolutely. We all have that DME stash that we, we find on the side of the road for sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so what does a home visit look like? What, what does it look like when you go into the home, Chris? So first and foremost, um, I bring all my supplies with me. And Karen and I, when we were developing this webinar, we may, I made a joke of I should really take a picture of my car because <laughs> on Monday, my car is fully stocked with everything that I could potentially need for a visit. Um, and I have supplies in my garage and I just try to anticipate having everything I need because I need to bring all supplies into the home. And I want to have everything that I could potentially need because I'm going to make that visit as efficient as possible. And if it's something that I have to wait because I have to order something or I need to run back to the office, that that isn't um, feasible nowadays because sometimes we do have visit limits or number of visits, especially with Medicare Advantage. So I want to be as prepared as possible. Um, other things that I bring with me into the home is equipment just to help with my body mechanics and treating the patient. So I have a folding stool that I bring into the house for every visit. This could be um, the only clean seat in the house, potentially, or it might be the place that I need to set all of my supplies because there's no clean spot for me to practice that clean bag technique or that. Um, so we have to bring those things with us. And, and in the home, there's all sorts of challenges. Um, we have to work around clutter, um, distractions, family members, pets, um, all pets need to be secured, especially when I'm doing things like wound care, because that could be a danger to the patient um, as far as infection and a danger to me as well. Um, and so when we complete a home care visit, um, always we're working on proper hand hygiene. We have what we call a bag technique where we have to keep our supplies clean. Um, oftentimes I'll have to create a contract with my patients so that I have a clean space to work. Um, in home health, I have to take vitals every visit. Um, that is not something I used to do in the outpatient clinic unless a patient was symptomatic. Um, I always, especially when I'm doing wound care, I'm taking temperature every visit to assess for any kind of um, signs and symptoms of infection. Home care, you're always having to adjust for that unexpected. Um, you have to be able to pivot at a moment's notice and, and to address the patient's concerns of, of what is happening in that moment. One of the other issues with home care that's a little bit different with outpatient, I know when I worked in the clinic, we would have patients that we'd see over the years and you would get to know them. But in home health, it is a very much change of, of boundaries. You're in a patient's home. Um, it's a much more intimate patient um, caregiver or therapist relationship. And so you have to set those really clear boundaries with patients and families. Um, and then constantly working to adjust your treatment session to the patient's abilities or even what kind of family support that they have. So Chris, I'm curious, when you go into a patient's home and they have that television blaring, um, do you say something right off the bat? I certainly do. And I just say, hey, do you mind if we just turn this right off? Because I'm distracted and I want to make sure that I'm 100% focused on you. So yes, I immediately look at that remote. <laughs> yeah, I think that um, for me, one of the biggest differences between home care and outpatient is that you're seeing people and they're the king and queen of their castle. And so you're even though you're there for a medical reason, it's like you're a guest. And 
it's very important to respect the fact that, that this is their home and this is where they're in control and they're in charge. And you can really see someone's true stripes at home more so than outpatient because outpatient people can talk a good story, but at home, they're more empowered because it's their home base. And they can tell you probably more directly, I believe, than, than in an outpatient, whether they're going to do something or not and whether their family's going to help them or not. <laughs> yeah. Yep. It, it, there's no beating around the bush sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. But in spite of all of that, there are so many advantages, as Chris has mentioned, um, that flexibility is such a plus. And for many people, that's just a really valuable thing. Um, the fact that you can provide longer treatment times if they're needed and really work your schedule around patient need. And I find that a lot if I see patients in an inpatient setting, too, is that I'll come in the room. And I'll know why I'm there, but I won't really know why I'm there because it can change from day to day. What's the real reason that you need me? And it may be something really unusual or off the wall that is going to make the difference for the patient that you may not have even planned on. So having that ability to be spontaneous and go with the flow and change goals and plans um, as well as schedules is so important. So, um, yeah. And then having that immediate access to the caregiver and home environment to be able to really see, okay, if we need to uh, see if they can get in and out of bed with a bandaged leg and, you know, how's their mobility for that? And, you know, what sort of equipment are they going to need to make it work? Because it's quite different getting on and off a treatment table. Some people have very, very high beds. And so really working around that and working with that, um, you know, as well as really seeing where they sleep, if it's, especially if it's a recliner chair, and especially if the recliner chair isn't going to elevate their legs all the way, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. I think that working um, with all the disciplines is so great because I feel like that team effort is so good because in outpatient, sometimes I feel a little alone with the patient because I don't have much access to the physician's office. Um, the patient isn't necessarily seeing other outpatient disciplines, but in home care, you know, we have this regular meeting time. We have uh, this flow of communication where we can ping each other instantly if something seems off or if we need to collaborate, if we need another team member to, um, to help back us up. Um, if we have information to give, um, there's, there's a great way to be able to have that communication in place. And then working with nursing. Um, I, I'm not wound care certified, but I have really found it so valuable to work with the wound care nurses. And sometimes you can schedule visits so that you can um, unwrap a patient's wound and do measurements and then have nursing come right after my visit so that they can rebandage the patient and re, you know, redress the wound. So that can, um, can be very, very helpful. So, um, and Chris, I know that you've seen a lot of patients over and over again throughout the years. Um, I have too, and how we just really keep providing care at whatever level they need, even if it's to that place where they're needing hospice. And um, that can be a very special transitional time to, to participate with a patient. It is. And I think it also brings a lot of comfort for the family because you've known them for years and you're someone that has cared for their loved one when they were more independent or when they were able to do more for themselves. And so I think um, it's almost like we have more credibility with their family and caregivers because of the long, um, long term of our relationship with them. Um, yeah. So that is really a gift of working in this environment. 
um, of being able to follow our patients um, when they make that transition to hospice as well. And I do see quite a number of um, patients when they are on hospice care for palliation um, with CLT. So palliative MLD, sometimes compression bandaging, working with families on how they can make their loved ones more comfortable. So it is something that's really special to work on that in the home environment. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So we've already touched a lot about scheduling and geographical areas. And um, I, I love the phrase captive audience, because if patients are homebound, then they're there. And so it makes it easier to be able to shuffle schedules for sure. And we talked about garage sales, but being able to, you know, if you've got like a favorite store that's in a certain geographical area, it's a real treat sometimes to be able to stop by and, you know, get a lunch or, or pick up a certain type of food that you enjoy or, you know, something that's, that's in a specialty store. And um, I know, Chris, you use your driving time a lot because you drive, how many, how many miles a week do you drive? Well, gosh, I would say on average, probably, I would say average, probably 500 miles a week. So average 100 miles a day um, between commute and, and patient care. So I do use my drive time a lot. It is the only way that I can get my books for book club completed. So I love Audible. <laughs> and then I also listen to a great podcasts. So we all have our favorites. So that's a good thing. That's great. Yeah. Well, I, I'm lucky that, um, you know, when I see patients at home, I'm, I'm in a more urban area. And so people are a lot closer together, but there can be some disadvantages. Uh, the home environment can be really unpredictable. You never know what you're going into, especially for, for OT, we're not necessarily the people that are going to open the case. So PTs though might, and nursing might, and, um, Sometimes um, we get the word, uh, you know, they'll give me the high sign that, you know, you better watch out for this family member or, um, you know, this, this may be an unsafe environment in this way if this happens. So just keep an eye out. Um, you know, we all have each other's backs. Um, I know that I just dread going into smokers' homes because I'll come out, you know, reeking and, you um, but again, it's their castle. Um, I do ask them to not smoke during visits um, because that can be distracting. And especially if you're doing, you know, different procedures and especially wound care. So another thing that I am more susceptible to um, because uh, my workplace is in Stockton, California, which is called informally the murder capital of the world. There are certain, I don't think the world, I think the US maybe, but there are some very unsafe neighborhoods where we don't want to be there after dark, certain hours of the day. Um, it's, it's just really important to be mindful. And um, also, we get triple digit temperatures the entire month of July and sometimes um, into June and August. And it can just be very uncomfortable uh, getting into a hot car. So I've gotten really good at finding shade to park under and, you know, any time that I possibly can. And, you know, Chris, I know you have more of the opposite in the wintertime where there's a lot of snow where you live in the Northeast. So that, that's that is a challenge. Yeah. Because yeah. oftentimes patients can't clear their driveway or clear their porch. And so you're, you're trudging in and out all day long. So those make for very long days of trying to get access to your patients. Yeah. So. Yeah. And sometimes when it's raining, you know, trying to keep things dry between the car and the house and garbage bags work pretty well. Thank you. Yeah. So we talked about distractions. Um, other disadvantages. Um, oh, I think, Chris, I think you should talk about your lymph mobile because um, I, I just love hearing about this. Um, I, I don't do full-time home health um, currently, but I have in the past and boy, oh boy, my car was just packed. It is true. And I think every home care therapist dreads when you have a new employee that you have to take for a ride along because it means you have to reshift everything from your front passenger seat to the back to make room for someone. Like I said earlier, on Monday, my car is completely organized. I mean, I carry everything with me. I have 
um, large sheets of gray cell foam. I have all of my other types of foam, um, foam prex, short stretch bandages. I have Velcro garments, my tubi grip, all two and three boxes of wound care supplies because you have to be prepared for the unexpected when you come into the home. Um, so by Monday, everything looks great. And by Friday afternoon, my car looks like a tornado has hit it. And so I spend the weekend to reorganize and make sure I have everything what I need. But that is the life of the home care therapist. I have probably six different donning devices that I bring with me so that, you know, there's always going to be a solution for the patient to get their compression garments on, um, adaptive equipment. And as Karen said, you know, when you're driving down the road and you see that yard sale or that rollator that's sitting at the end of someone's driveway, well, that happens to make it in the car too, because you know someone that needs that as well. So that is the life of the home care therapist, that their car is always full. Um, so I definitely have a car that I use predominantly for work for this purpose. <laughs> And then your snacks, you know, your personal oh, care equipment. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, much to my husband's dismay, my favorite snack is popcorn. So that's usually all over the car by the end of the week as well. <laughs> <laughs> and then just hauling in all of your equipment, your, you know, your electronics. And, you know, there may or may not be internet service at the patient's home. That's where it's it's nice to be able to have a, a, a satellite internet if, if possible. But even then, if you're in a valley and don't have access to that, um, sometimes you have to wait until you can get a signal. Um, and same thing with a phone. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I spend a lot of time in driveways making phone calls because, you know, we don't want to necessarily talk to another patient from a certain patient's home. Um, the times we would make calls would be if we needed to, to um, reach out to the doctor's office or if there was an urgent need to call the, the home care agency. But by and large, um, you know, that's what, where it's nice to have that headset when you're driving and, um, and that driveway time for sure. Absolutely. Yep. And I live in an area that we don't have great cell service, so it can be really challenging or, and then that makes it difficult even for me to connect to my EMR in the patient's home, which then adds to that increased documentation time at home because we're not right. able to complete it in the home due to those technology gaps. Yeah. 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 And then, you know, just addressing sanitation that, um, as you mentioned before, Chris, having that, that um, clean space and, you know, bringing in all this, um, you know, gear and equipment to, to keep it clean and good. So, yeah. Um, you know, some other uh, disadvantages I talked about, um, the true colors, um, sometimes you just cannot predict compliance, you can't predict a patient's reaction to something, it can really vary. And I think the saddest part for me is if we have a patient whose needs are changing or are not met, and just really trying to rally their family and rally the resources to be able to do that. And uh, I have never had to call Adult Protective Services, but I've come close a couple of times. And um, it's, it's heartbreaking sometimes to uh, see a patient that really needs that higher level of care that is not getting their needs met. I have made that call several times oh. <laughs> and it, it is frustrating and it's hard because again, too, there's not much that can happen with that, but it at least um, first and foremost is involving, you know, the doctor's office and as many of the patient's care team as possible when the situation arises. And again, like you said, it's ultimately trying to find that higher, higher level of care for that patient and advocating for them to get the services that they need. So that takes a lot away from our visit because that might be what we're doing for that patient, but that's what's most appropriate at that time. For sure. Yeah. I mean, we just have to kind of, you know, keep dancing on our toes. And there can be some stress on the therapist because of these heartbreaking scenarios. And um, 
all the change that happens and the documentation. I will not lie. Home care documentation is the most extensive and the most laborious documentation that you're ever going to encounter. So if you don't like documentation, home care is not a good setting for you. No, and yeah. it's constantly changing. So yeah. yeah, just when you you have it down, Medicare decides to change. So yeah. it, it's the only constant. <laughs> So it is important for therapists to have um, stress relieving practices and um, driving can really be a, a great way of letting go of stress, but it can also be stressful too, you know, with, with weather and traffic challenges. So being able to have all of that, the tools in the toolbox for stress relief is so important. So let's talk a little bit about some of the, the typical types of home patients. Because this is a, primarily an elderly population, we're going to be seeing a lot of venous patients, a lot of wounds, and a fair amount of obesity-related lymphedema, and then some secondary lymphedema because of cancer and trauma and immobility. But I would say that one of my biggest challenges is really all the comorbidities that are involved that other disciplines such as nursing, um, PT are working on um, to really help to um, bring them back in balance, to increase mobility. And, um, you know, we touched on um, level of care and compliance. And if a patient just doesn't have help in the home, then we really need to look at finding a different level of care where they can have their needs met. Um, it's so important, especially with lymphedema, which is so um, uh, home management oriented. If the patient just can't do it themselves, um, I would say that pneumatic compression can be a gift from God for a lot of these patients because it can be so much easier for them to use than um, performing their own MLD. But um, uh, sometimes patients can't always get in and out by themselves. Um, and we have to really work creatively with donning aids and um, even caregivers, depending on the, the situation. Um, so that, that's... that is true, Karen. Yeah, when compliance or when a patient doesn't have a caregiver, oftentimes if I'm going out to see them, it might just be an evaluation with maybe one or two visits to talk about what could we do as a plan of care. I'm always going to instruct, you know, skincare and exercise, things that they could start, but then educate them on what um, a plan of care would look like um, to treat their lymphedema. And oftentimes then they might come back with a new referral when they are ready, when they've been able to identify someone to be that caregiver. And then I know that they are invested and they have buy-in. Um, so there's never a waste of an evaluation to educate a patient about what's possible, but sometimes they're not ready, and but they'll come back to us when they are. Yeah, no, it's always great to leave that open door. So we see a lot of wounds and um, so important to be able to have at least basic wound care skills so that we can measure the circumference against the skin. And we might have to call in nursing um, unexpectedly. Um, we might have to um, perform, um, you know, dressing changes if there's a sudden change in exudate between nursing visits. Um, and, um, you know, we talked about pneumatic compression. Um, that is uh, a really helpful modality for patients with wounds and to help accelerate the wound healing as well as prevent further wounds. So I want to just emphasize though, that if a patient has a really juicy wound and you're using pneumatic compression for the first time, we all know that you've got to really pad up that wound and maybe even use a garbage bag just to help um, deal with the exudate because the first few times that you decongest uh, an an area that has a wound, it's going to really, really go for it. So um, we're, we've got a few case studies to present, and this is one of Chris's patients. Um, yeah. yeah, so this is a patient of mine that I used to see an outpatient for years, and um, when she no longer could make it to the clinic, and I, 
I initially, when I was an outpatient, um, I started to do a split between home health and outpatient because we had patients like this young lady that couldn't make it into the clinic. And as you can see from her pictures, um, she has scattered stasis ulcerations on her lower legs. Um, you can see all the scars from her healed stasis ulcers. And then from the lateral view, you can see just um, the abrasions uh, from her thigh lobules. And what would happen is she didn't fit through the door frames of her apartment. And every time she would walk through the door frame, it would scrape and create this constant skin breakdown. Um, so she's a 48 year old female and um, she had, again, um, constant open stasis ulcers and wounds. And she was often hospitalized four times a year for cellulitis on average. So when I started to see her at home, first and foremost, um, I wanted to break that infection cycle to keep her out of the hospital and keep her at home. So I worked very closely with um, nursing on um, trying to establish a good wound care and skin care program for her. So this was a challenge because the home was very cluttered. She lived in um, a three bedroom apartment with her husband, her three adult children, her three grandchildren, three rabbits, four cats, and two dogs. <laughs> so to even have a clean working space, um, her husband would mop the, an area of the kitchen floor for me um, so that I had a place to sit and work. Um, and the patient would sit on a metal folding chair because otherwise she spent the rest of her day in a recliner. She couldn't get her legs into a hospital bed. Um, she could get into the bed with assistance, but as soon as she elevated, of course, then she would decongest and would need to get to the restroom. And so she would get out of bed and then couldn't get back into the bed by herself. Um, her husband worked outside of the home, so she was on her own all day long. So in addition to getting nursing in to coming up with a good plan of skincare for her legs, I also got our social worker involved and we applied for um, assistance through the state to get a home health aid in um, to see her daily. And that home health aid would come in and wash her legs, um, do her skincare, and then also either apply um, multi-layer compression bandaging, which I had trained the home health aid to do, or when she was fit with Velcro compression, I would use Velcro compression with foam. So the aides were doing that because her husband would leave early in the morning. So the aides would help her with compression on the days that I wasn't there. And then he would assist with um, using her pneumatic compression pump with her at night. And as you can see over time, um, we were able to get decongestion um, and we were able to heal her wounds. Um, if we could advance, I think a couple slides, Karen, yeah. you can see. Um, so again, her wounds are healed. Um, she no longer scraped the door frames when walking through them. She did have significant reduction, but she still has significant lymphedema. And a lot of that is due to the inability to elevate in a hospital bed at night. It's due to the limitations from her environment um, of essentially kind of living in a recliner her home was so cluttered and congested, it really wasn't safe for her to walk much. Um, so she didn't do a lot of physical activity. Um, so we kept her out of the hospital um, for almost a two year span, um, which was a humongous improvement. Um, we got her hooked up with services with having home health aides. She had meals on wheels, um, which was great because then she had at least one meal a day that was better balanced than what the rest of the family was eating. Um, but ultimately, this is a patient that needed a higher level of care and she eventually um, was assisted with, with our social worker and with all of us and her care team to, to transition to long-term care. Um, and now her legs look so much better because she has daily care. She's sleeping in a hospital bed. Um, she's had a significant weight loss. Um, so, and she's much more mobile than she was at home. So it actually was an improvement for her life quality to move to that higher level of care. That's great. Um, I would love to share about um, one of my patients who um, had breast cancer related lymphedema. And um, 
uh, this is a 54 year old female who had recently undergone radiation therapy without much arm swelling. You can see all, uh, you know, how, how saggy her arm is, but um, she had a lot of um, axillary edema and a lot of skin changes as a result of the radiation therapy. And she was unable to come in to the outpatient clinic because of the COVID quarantine. So I saw her in the home and I performed and taught her some gentle MLD, which helped accelerate the healing from the um, radiation therapy. And then we started her on some quilted compression um, as her skin was, was healing and she could tolerate it. I brought the laser into the home, which also helped with wound healing. And then I referred her back to outpatient after two months when the outpatient clinic opened up again. So that can um, make a big difference, you know, where a patient is um, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the, the level of care. Um, another um, case study, which uh, I think this was your patient, Chris, you, you want to talk about that patient? Sure. So um, I think if you can find the picture. Um... I'm looking for the picture and. Um... Right oh, you know what? This... I skipped. Yep. I skipped. There we are. Yep. There we go. So this was another patient, and as you can see, a, a lot of my home care population um, is the morbidly obese and obesity-related um, uh, comorbidities of lymphedema. So this young lady, she was 54, she lived alone, and um, she was referred to me after a prolonged hospital stay with cellulitis and sepsis. Um, so first and foremost, I knew that she was not going to be able to manage her compression or her skin care or her pneumatic compression pump um, on her own. So I had to work again with social work and with her provider on trying to get her approved to have um, help at home. So we got her approved for a home health aid and funding for that. And then additionally, um, to complete her skin care, Due to her wide base of support, due to her lobules and her legs, she could not stand in the shower to where she could face the shower or even turn around. She had to stand sideways in her tub. So she was only effectively able to wash one side of her body at a time. Um, and this was a challenge because she had issues with incontinence and that. So again, I had to work with her provider and with the state to see if we could get her a barrier free shower. So again, these are some of the hats that the home care therapist wears in addition to treating their lymphedema. But if we didn't do this, I couldn't effectively treat her lymphedema because skin care and skin hygiene is so important to reduce that risk of cellulitis. Um, so again, eventually we got all of these things accomplished. Um, we achieved some reduction and got her fit with compression that she could wear daily, that she could ambulate in safely. Um, and that she had a caregiver that would come in um, and they would help her with her pump, they would help her with her skin care, and then they would put her in her compression. And then we managed to get where the patient could independently dock her compression with adaptive equipment. So that was kind of the success for her disease management of her lymphedema. One of the things that I love about home care is that we get to think outside of the box. And um, it can be challenging for any patient to perform MLD, but especially if patients are homebound and have mobility issues, we need to be mindful that there are lots of different modifications that we can make. And I actually had a patient uh, turn me on to the idea of using a paint roller. Uh, because it's soft and it has an extended handle. You can see that there's like a, a mini roller and there's an edging tool. And she actually used the um, edging tool for gentle lymphedema. She had a hard time reaching. And I've used the paint rollers a lot with patients that can't reach their legs. Um, I would be cautious about a rolling pin. I have had patients use that, but you need to pad it. So that's where um, maybe taping some gray foam over that would be helpful. And vibration can be helpful for uh, using um, on patients that have a lot of fibrosis. You can use it around the wound. 
um, carefully and gently, um, maybe even padded. And you can follow the MLD drainage patterns using the uh, vibration tool that can be very effective. The jade roller, um, I use mostly for facial edema um, because it's so small. And the brush I use hardly at all um, because many of the patients, especially the ones I see at home, um, have very fragile skin or skin issues. And so the, the brushing may be a little too aggressive for some. As far as compression goes, the most common um, compression in the intensive phase is um, either a multi-layer compression bandaging or Velcro garments with foam padding if patients have trouble um, learning bandaging or elastic compression with foam layers to help um, uh, keep it from um, migrating. And then of course we use a lot of the wound care wrap systems. I love using um, textured compression if fibrosis is present, but um, we have to be careful again with skin for that. Um, other things um, for compression in the maintenance phase would be a hybrid netted elastic, um, which is less expensive than edema wear. Um, and uh, I think we can say brand names. Um, do you recall the brand name of that, Chris? Um, I use a lot. It's through 3M and then um, there's a spandic grip um, that I'll use as well. So yeah. in lots of layers. Yeah. Yeah. And then the, the, the tuba grip with gray foam and chip foam bags under Coban wrap. And I think everyone, hopefully everyone knows the, the, the trick of um, vet wrap being less expensive than Coban wrap. And it's essentially the same thing. And I've had patients who um, use a lot of that non-adherent dressing. Um, you can order it by the case on Amazon and it's, it's pretty inexpensive, or you can send the patient's family down to the feed store um, to pick up some vet wrap because that can be really, really helpful. Um, I did have uh, several patients that love doing the Unaboot with the vet wrap over it. Um, so halfway through the week, they, they wrap over it so that it keeps the compression. And um, that can be fairly expensive, for, but for people with really frail skin um, uh, that, that just are not healing in other ways, that Unaboot with all the zinc oxide can be really healing for the skin. We know that the insurance regulations really vary for compression garments, and uh, we're still starting to get information about the Lymphedema Treatment Act and coverage. And bottom line is, is that we're not going to know for sure until next year, till they actually start billing what's really going to get covered, how many garments. Um, we have a pretty good idea now, but um, you know we're still working it out. And um, important to have the documentation requirements with uh, diagnosis and justification for need. And patients with managed care plans will have some additional hoops to jump through for sure. Um, so even with the Lymphedema Treatment Act, that's going to be another little wrinkle to work out. So we talked a little bit about um, fitting. Um, Chris, I would love for you to address um, compression for large patients because you do see so many people that are, are bariatric patients in the home. Absolutely. So when I'm trying to um, fit them for garments, especially when measuring, um, I will um, always try to position them in the best way possible. But to keep um, the, the lobules in their legs, I'll use shelf liner in addition to kind of the tubi grip or the elastic to prevent that migration of the lobules. Um, I have lots of patients with really large abdominal canises and trying to get them to elevate that canis and offload their inguinals um, to create um, a reduction because they will get that fluid that that is gravity dependent and create that fibrosis. Um, so in the recliner, I'll have them elevate their panis. I'll have them either use a blanket or a towel as like a sling under their panis to lift it so that they can do some self MLD while they're offloading the inguinals. 
if they want to sit upright, I had a patient that used to actually lift her abdominal pianus by her belly button, which caused it to stretch out to have a diameter of greater than five inches. Um, and her pianus would hang below her knees. And she would get so frustrated with me that I wanted her to elevate because she liked to do things. She liked to knit. So I had her get, um, they have these great adjustable stools that a lot of us in home care use that we can bring into the house. So she got one of these stools that could fit between her legs and I put some padding on it so that she could actually elevate her pianist when she's sitting and while she's knitting. So it took gravity out of the situation. So between elevating in the recliner like that and with the stool, she lost almost 11 pounds in two weeks with, with just taking gravity out of the equation of her abdomen and pianist. So that's really important. Other things that we can do for compression in the home for our, our obese patients is um, we can use pneumatic compression, um, you know, kudos to LymphoPress. I use the LymphoPod a lot for these patients um, if we can get it approved, but, or I might even have them use um, pneumatic compression on one extremity while I'm doing and treating the other one because I might not have time to do both in the visit, but then at least they're both getting treated and then bandaging. Um, and then Karen, you can speak to this last of using the compression sleeve for the pianist. Yeah, I had a patient that we just could not physically mobility wise get her into a pantsuit because that would have been the ideal treatment. So we just used a very large leg sleeve and we anchored it and it was brilliant for reducing her panis. We just stuck the panis in the leg sleeve and it, it really helped so much. So sometimes you just wow. have to really think outside the box. Definitely. And, you know, skincare, oh my gosh, that is such a big challenge that, you know, we, we need to work on always. Um, and in terms of the long-term treatment plan, um, it's going to be similar, but different to outpatient. And it, it, it can be a real mix of daytime, nighttime garments, use of pumps, use of exercise program. But overall, when we're looking at our goals for these patients, um, it's going to be a little different at home than outpatient. Really, our priority is to have them be more functional at home as opposed to total volume reduction. It may not be the perfect reduction, but if we can reduce them enough so that they can have better mobility that, you know, and, and break the cycle of cellulitis infections and hospitalizations of wounds. And a lot of patients are just happy to be able to fit into shoes again. So, and, you know, we really want them to not be homebound. That's a success story if a patient can be mobile enough to leave their home. So we can play a really important role in that. We've got another case study coming up here as we're winding up here. So um, the reason I included this one is because I know that Karen and I both have such um hatred for our patients that just sit in recliners. And so case in point, um, this picture is my patient. Um, and you can see on the left side, the left picture, on the left side of the picture is her popliteal fossa. So she essentially lived in her recliner and there was a negative space between the end of the seat depth and where the leg rest was. And all of that fluid just became gravity dependent and just collected behind her knees. That second picture is actually a posterior view. So those are her popliteal fossas that we're looking at. And she couldn't stand on her own. She could not bend her knees because she had so much swelling. And in that deep um, sulci at the popliteal fossa, she had weeping and deep fissures and wounds because of this. So I worked with her. Um, she was thinking that she was going to have to move into a nursing home because of her mobility. She lived by herself. So she managed to hire caregivers. We managed to work on reducing this area, fitting her um, with Velcro compression that she could take off on her own um, and using a pneumatic compression pump. And with that, and with caregivers just three hours a day to help her with her skincare and her program, she managed to stay at home for another 18 months before she had to move to long-term care, which allowed her to do it in a time frame that was, you know, more on her terms 
and versus her mobility was just really dictating the need for higher level of care. That's so great. That's awesome. So speaking of different level of care, um, you know, we've talked about hospice, we've talked about palliation of symptoms and, you know, the, the using that focus. And um, one of my patients was a 61 year old female with inflammatory breast cancer. And she underwent um, radiation therapy. She was on ongoing chemo. She became less and less mobile. And uh, our, our treatment plan really got focused towards um, palliation and training her whole family in being able to make her comfortable, to be able to do MLD, to be able to use pneumatic compression to help give her some relief, as well as quilted and elastic compression garments. The, the goal not being complete reduction, but just comfort. So you want to take this one, Chris? Yeah. So some of the benefits of home care is that we can use so many different alternative things. Um, this was a patient of mine, um, and this is actually a picture of him putting on his nighttime compression, what he uses. Um, so I, he had cellulitis um, in his upper leg, and he had a really large thigh lobule, and you can see the disparaging size of his thigh compared to his lower leg. So wrapping him with traditional short stretch bandaging and trying to create that nice gradient was a challenge. And then it was a challenge. As soon as he stood up and tried to walk, everything would fall. Um, I even worked on trying to train his wife and teaching him with short stretch bandaging. So I learned um, from another therapist, Andrea Brennan, she told me about using a lot of this elastic netting. So we, this is what my patient can independently put on for nighttime compression. And he does layers of gray foam with chip pads, um, uh, pit packs. He has tubi grips of three different sizes that he layers up and he'll put another tubi grip on top of his gray foam here. But I just wanted you to see this and he can don this in about five minutes at night versus when his wife was trying to bandage him, it would take over a half an hour and it was just not feasible for compliance. And he'll sleep in this. He says it's very comfortable. And in the morning when he gets up, he has significant decongestion of his lobule and of all the fibrosis in his thigh. For his daytime garments, um, he's someone that I've discharged. So he wears a flat knit capri um, pant that again, he can get into with a little bit of assistance from his wife. And then he wears um, knee high open toe um, flat knit stockings. So he has a ways to go. He's 720 pounds. He goes to the pool three times a week and he exercises in the water. Um, and he's working with a bariatric program on his weight loss. But in the meantime, he's got a really great program. He also uses a lymphopod pump. Um, I try to get him to use it every day, but he uses it four days a week on the days that he doesn't go to the pool. And he's got a really good maintenance program going and he's very good about skincare. So this is a success, but I just like to show this picture of kind of alternatives to compression that our patients can use and be successful with. He also is very aware that he needs to bevel his foam and he does it very well. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, let's just sum it all up here because um, we want to leave just a, a little bit of time for questions and answers, but um, really to, to look at the benefits is that I really feel there's such a deeper rapport and emotional intimacy in the home setting because you're, you're being invited in like a friend or a family member and we are guests in their home. And um, so it can be challenging to maintain the professional boundaries and avoid, avoid dual relationships. I think that, uh, you know, a lot of my patients want to cook meals for me <laughs> or send me home with jars of jam, which I do accept. Um, I accept jam. I don't accept meals. Um, I'll, I'll take a, an occasional cookie now and then. Um, but I think that it's just really important to make sure that we have that you know, professional um, relationship with them, even though we are being treated like friends and family. And 
that works to our favor though, because ultimately we can affect healing on different and deeper levels in the, in the clinic. And would you have anything to add to that, Chris? No, I just think we, we do have that privilege of establishing a greater, um, therapy, um, therapeutic relationship with our patients. Um, and oftentimes I tell my patients, um, that I am happy to be their, their lymphedema resource. So I will get phone calls from patients. I'll get texts just needing direction of what they need to do. And sometimes that generates a new referral for home health, or maybe it's just to help them into the next step of whether they're transitioning to outpatient and that. So, um, it's like you said, it's an environment that is really rewarding. And I really love treating patients in the home care environment because it's the most functional environment to see our lymphedema patients. For sure. Well, I'm going to stop sharing because I saw Brenda hopping on and I, I hopped on. I'm glad my microphone wasn't open because I was gasping throughout <laughs> some of the presentation. First of all, thank you both for your candor. We really got sort of a, a look behind the curtain of what goes on. I know many of our attendees, they live this day in and day out. And yet to see your case studies and your outcomes and your heart, you are angels that go into people's homes and you give them hope. And so for that, we are so grateful. I'm also incredibly grateful that you mentioned the lymphopod. So many people think there's not a pneumatic compression option for me because I'm too big. And I will tell you, the lymphopod is a game changer. And our team at Lympha Press would be honored to work with you to help do what it takes to take care of these larger patients and especially in a home setting. So thank you for mentioning that as well. If we don't have any questions, any closing words from you, Chris, or you, Karen? And I actually sort of had one question. Shoot. So I'll throw it at you. So you both mentioned that there had been times when you wondered if you needed to call authorities to get involved with a situation. You actually had to, Chris. You ended up not doing it, Karen. But how do you know when you have to make that call? Like when you can't shake it, is that when you just call? Um, when the patient's safety is at risk, and that can be through self-neglect. It can be through um, a situation in the home because of caregivers and, and not healthy relationships in that regard. But most of the time when I've had to call adult protective services is um, cases of self-neglect and, and that it's just poor safety oh. awareness in the home. Yep. Wow. Well, we hear from one of our attendees from Missy Baylor. She says, great job, ladies. She's glad to see how we accomplish goals by thinking outside of the box. She's used several of these ideas, such as the netted stocking. I was so impressed by the lymph mobile that you have, <laughs> Chris. And I can only, like, I almost hear theme music as you're going from place to place, driving hundreds of miles a day with your popcorn. And yet, <laughs> you know, what I'm most impressed by is neither of you know for sure, especially if it's a new client, what you're walking into. Oh, so you have to be that's, that's half the fun. Yeah. yeah, it is. It is. Wow. Well, thank you for what you do. And thank you for sharing this excellent information, which will live on. Everybody who has registered will receive a copy of the recording. We get lots of replays on our YouTube channel and on our website from Lympha Press. I thank you, Chris. I thank you, Karen. And thank you for tuning in to this edition of the Lympha Press educational webinar series. Thanks so much and have a great night, everybody. <laughs>